So tonight, uh, actor um, Jackson Gilman will perform his one-man show, Kipling Revisited. Kipling was the most celebrated author of his day, best known for the Jungle Book, okay? The first four years of his marriage and fatherhood were spent in Vermont, where he built his dream house, now preserved as a historical landmark. These were very productive, happy, and troubled years for the young literary giant. He was a guarded, private individual, but this performance will provide an inside look at his experience in New England and some of the controversy surrounding this complex man. This performance will also include a selection of Kipling's poems and stories. And uh, so you're going to be hearing from Kipling first, and then Gilman will answer all any and all questions you have about Kipling. And yes, I have purposely avoided using his first name because I have misspelled it and mispronounced it for the last six weeks. So all uh, 40 or 50 of us or so, let's give a big round of applause. What a warm welcome, man. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's actually, at my age, it's a pleasure to be anywhere. <laughs> uh, I'm not very short, a little shy of 155 years old. Mm. And if you're wondering how that feels, it feels like the new 100. <laughs> and it is wonderful to be back here in New England. Uh, I, some of my happiest times of my life were spent in, in New England. And, uh, if things had worked out better, I would have been very glad to live out all my years in the lovely uh, state of Vermont there. And there's, I've often been said there are only two places I really wanted to live, and that was Bombay and Brattleboro, and things just didn't work quite, quite work out that way. But, well, you're here and I'm here, and uh, I, I'm, I, you're going to hear some stories and some poems and um, uh, delivered by someone else, but, but these stories that you're going to hear uh, are definitely meant to be told aloud. And uh, there's a, a quote of mine that I'd like to share. There is no line of my verse of prose which has not been mouthed, till the tongue has made all smooth, and memory after many recitals has mechanically skipped the grosser superfluities. <laughs> now, if you're wondering what that actually means, uh, it's kind of a fancified, sesquipedalian way, or fancified way of saying simply that before those words were written down on the paper, they were spoken, mouthed many times. And I insist that that is the best way to edit one's work, by mouthing the words. You get rid of all the things that don't need to be there. It's a, it's a very efficient way to work. And, and, and doing that, I took some liberties with um, the English language, and I didn't always follow proper rules of grammar or pronunciation, particularly with the just so stories. For example, in the story that you're going to hear later about the elephant's child who asked ever so many questions, you might say that he was full of insatiable curiosity. But if you look very carefully to how it's written on the page, he says he was full of satiable curiosity. <laughs> I don't think you'll find that in the dictionary. <laughs> no. Similarly, when we're talking about the camel who's exceedingly lazy, he's described as being excruciating idle. Well, I, I took many such liberties throughout, and um, it just made it more fun to tell and more fun to listen to. It didn't curry me much favor, though, with the literary critics of the day who thought I was a little too liberal in my use of the language and was taking too much license. And as a matter of fact, as a, I remember sending off a manuscript as a young man, and, and I was having very good fortune having everything I sent in so, uh, accepted. But uh, one editor wanted to see fit to put me in my place, and he, he wrote back in 1887, I'm sorry, Mr. Kipling, but you just don't know how to use the English language. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I had listened to that pea brain of a critic, I might not have gone to be one of the most <laughs> popular authors of the time, and actually the one of the most quoted authors of the English language, perhaps second only to Shakespeare, who I doff my hat to. But um, 
you know, it could be argued whether or not English was my first language because I, as a young lad, grew up in India and I spoke fluent Hindi with my, everyone around me. But I think I did master it well enough to become the first recipient of a Nobel Prize writer who wrote in the English language. So um, thank you very much for that encouragement, Mr. Editor. <laughs> well, a good example of, of saying the words so that they sm become smooth, there's going to be a line in the story about the, the elephant's child who asks ever so many questions. And he goes on a grand expedition to the banks of the great gray-green Greasy Limpopo River. Now, if you've never had the pleasure of, of, of mouthing those words, I, I'm going to give you that opportunity in a minute. But I want you to listen again. The Great Gray Green Greasy Limpopo River. Would you try that with me? The Great Gray Green Greasy Limpopo. I want those words delicious. You just want to eat them right up. <laughs> you might have a chance to, to recite that at some point in, in the program tonight. Um, and these stories of the Just So, uh, why they were called Just So, I, I told these stories to my children in the evening after the meal, evening meal, and they got very familiar with the stories. So familiar with them that they insisted that I tell those stories just so. <laughs> which is how they became known as the Just So Stories. And there's many references in the stories to my best beloved, because that's who they created for. They inspired my, my daughter, my firstborn. She was born here in the States, so I, I referred to her as my little American. <laughs> and she was, named, she was Josephine, and she was named after me. People don't realize that my real name was Joseph Rudyard Kipling. But uh, she indeed was uh, my best beloved, and, and soon followed by another best beloved, her sister, and then later, much later, by her brother. So I had three, and I, I loved telling stories to them, and I loved children, and I hope that is reflected in the, in the stories that I created, for, especially for them. So we've kept the old best beloved reference sprinkled throughout the Just So stories, and you might be able to hear those uh, as we go on. Well, you know, these stories are, are very animated and they are really require lots of energy to tell. And um, as, I, as you know, I'm getting on in years and I don't know if I have the proper mm, agility and, and energy to do them justice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little shut eye for a little while and come back later in the program to uh, recite some poems and perhaps answer some questions. But I am going to turn the rest of the program for a while over to a younger storyteller who's much more spry than I am to Mr. Gilman. And I'm going to ask him to make sure that he wakes me before you leave, because I do want to talk to you again before you go and, and, and recite a poem at least or two. And um, Mr. Gilman, yes, yeah. Uh, they, they, they've learned that line and they're very game. I, they, even though they're older, they're, they're very young at heart, I can tell. Yes, and be sure to wake me up because I don't want to miss them. Yes. Yeah, 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 I'll be sure. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Kevin, yeah, I'll be sure to remember. Don't worry, yes, I, I promise, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> In the high and far off times, the elephant, oh, best beloved, had no trunk. He had only a blackish, bulgy nose, about as big as a boot, that he could wriggle about from side to side, but he couldn't pick things up with it. But there was one elephant, a new elephant, an elephant's child, and he was full of satiable curiosity. And this means that he asked ever so many questions. And he lived in Africa, and he filled all of Africa with his satiable curiosities. He asked his tall auntie ostrich why her tail feathers grew just so. And his tall auntie ostrich spanked him with her hard, hard claw. Hmm. He asked his tall uncle the giraffe what made his skin spotty, and his tall uncle the giraffe spanked him with his hard, hard hoof. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. He asked his broad anthopotamus why her eyes were red, and his broad anthopotamus spanked him with her broad, broad hoof. And he asked his hairy uncle baboon why melons tasted just so, and his hairy uncle baboon spanked him with one hairy, hairy paw. Do you know, he asked questions about everything that he saw, or he heard, or he felt, or he smelt, or he touched, and all his aunts and uncles spanked him. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. 
Well, one fine morning, in the middle of the procession of equinoxes, this satiable elephant's child asked a new fine question that he had never asked before. He asked, What does the crocodile have for dinner? <laughs> and everybody said, Hush! In a loud and dreadful tone, and spanked immediately and directly without stopping for a long time. By and by, when that was finished, he came upon his friend, Colo Colo Bird, sitting in the middle of a weighted bit thorn bush. He said, My father and my mother and all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my insatiable curiosity, and still I want to know what the crocodile has for dinner. And then Colo Colo Bird said in a mournful cry, Go to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, all set out with fever trees, and find out. Well, that very next morning, when there was nothing all left of the equinoxes because the procession had proceeded according to its precedent, this satiable elephant child packed 100 pounds of bananas, 100 pounds of sugarcane, and 17 melons, and said to all his dear families, goodbye. I am going to the banks of the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, to find out what the crocodile has for dinner. And they spanked him once more for luck, <laughs> though he asked them most politely to stop. And then he went on, a little warm, but not at all astonished, eating melons <laughs> and throwing the rind about because he couldn't pick them up. And he sang this song. I'm going to the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River <laughs> to find out what the crocodile likes to eat for dinner. <laughs> you learn that line. You could try singing it with me. Humor me and try it with me. Okay, try it. I'm going to the great gray green greasy Limpopo River. You can take a melon if you like. <laughs> to find out what the crocodile likes to eat for dinner. <laughs> well, he kept on walking and singing, eating the melons and throwing the rind about because he couldn't pick them up. To last, he came to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, and it was all set out with fever trees, precisely as his friend Colo Colo Bert had said. Now, you must know and understand, O oh best beloved, that till this very weekday hour and minute, this satiable elephant child had never seen a crocodile. It was all his satiable curiosity. Well, the very first thing that he found there was a bicolored python rock snake curled round a rock. <laughs> oh, excuse me, but do you happen to have seen such a thing as a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? seen a crocodile, <laughs> said the bicolored python rock singing in a voice of dreadful scorn. What will you ask me next? <laughs> Excuse me, but could you please tell me what he has for dinner? <laughs> and then the bicolored python rock singing uncoiled himself very quickly from the rock and spanked the elephant's child with a scale some flails and tail. <sighs> That's odd because my father and my mother and all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my insatiable curiosity. And I suppose this is the same thing. So he said goodbye, very politely to the bicolored python rocks. Like he even helped to coil them around the rock again. And he went on, a little warm, but not at all astonished, was eating melons and throwing the rind about because he couldn't pick them up and, and, and making up new songs. What does the crocodile have for dinner? I really, really, really want to know. I'm off to the great, gray, green, greasy Limpopo River. <laughs> well, he kept on walking and singing, eating the melons and throwing the rind about because he couldn't pick them up. Till at last, he stepped on what he thought was, oops, ooh, a log of wood at the very edge of the great, gray, green, greasy Limpopo River. But it was really the crocodile, oh, best beloved. And he winked one eye like this. Oh, excuse me, but do you happen to have seen such a thing as a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? And then the crocodile winked the other eye like this and lifted half of his tail out of the mud. The elephant's child stepped back most politely because he did not wish to be spanked again. Come hither, little one. 
Why do you ask such things? Uh, excuse me, but you see, my father and my mother and all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my insatiable curiosity, and including the bicolored python rocks that just up the bank and spank harder than any of them with a the scale some flail some tail. So if it's quite all the same to you, I don't wish to be spanked again. Come hither, little one, for I am the crocodile. And he wept crocodile tears to show that it was quite true. <laughs> then the elephant side grew all breathless and kneeled down in the back and said, you are the very person I've been looking for all these long days. Will you please tell me what you have for dinner? Come hither, little one, and I'll, I'll whisper. So the elephant shouted, put his head down close to the crocodile's musky, tusky mouth, and the crocodile caught him by his little nose up to that very minute had been no bigger than a boot and no more useful. I think, said the crocodile, and he said it between his teeth like this, I think today I will begin with elephant's child. <laughs> At this, the elephant child was much annoyed, and he said, speaking through his nose, let go, you're hurting me. Then the bicolored python rocks that came down and said, my young friend, if you do not now immediately and instantly pull as hard as ever you can, it is my opinion that your acquaintance in a large pattern leather ulster, and by this he meant the crocodile, oh best beloved, will jerk you into yonder limpid stream before you can say Jack Robinson. This is the way all bicolored python rock snakes talk. <laughs> So the elephant child sat back his little haunches and he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and his nose began to stretch. And the crocodile floundered into the water making it creamy with great sweeps of his tail and he pulled and pulled and pulled and the elephant child's nose kept on stretching. The elephant child spread all his four little legs and pulled and pulled and pulled and the crocodile thrust his tail like an oar and he pulled and pulled and pulled and each pull the elephant child's nose grew longer and longer and longer and hurt him awful. And then the elephant child felt his legs slipping. And he said, speaking through his nose, which is now nearly five feet long, this is too much for me. Then the bicolored python rock snake scuffled down from the bank and knotted himself in a double clove hitch around the elephant child's hind legs. Rash and inexperienced traveler, who will now seriously devote ourselves to a little high tension. Because if we do not, it is my impression that yonder self-propelling man of war with the armor-plated upper deck, and by this he meant the crocodile, oh best beloved, will permanently vitiate your future career. This is the way bicolored python rock snakes always talk. So he pulled, and the elephant child pulled, and the crocodile pulled. But the elephant child and the bicolored python rock snake pulled the hardest. To last, the crocodile had to let go of the poor elephant child's nose with a plop. That you could hear all up and down the Limpopo. Oh, the elephant's child sat down most hard and sudden, but first he was careful to say, thank you, to the bicolored python rock stick. And next he was kind to his poor pulled nose, and he wrapped it all up in cool banana leaves, and he hung it in the great gray green greasy Limpopo River to cool. What are you doing that for? Excuse me, but my nose is badly out of shape, and I'm waiting for it to shrink. <laughs> then you will have to wait a long time. Some people don't know what's good for them. Well, the elephant's child sat there for three days waiting for his nose to shrink, but it never did grow any shorter, and besides, it made him squint. For you will see and understand, O oh best beloved, that the crocodile had pulled it out into a really truly trunk, same as all elephants <coughs> have today. Now, at the end of the third day, a fly came and stung him on his shoulder. <coughs> and before the elephant child even thought what he was doing, he picked up his trunk and he hit the fly dead with the end of it. <sighs> Vantage number one. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Try and eat a little now. Before the elephant shout out what he was doing, he put out his trunk, plucked up a large bundle of grass, dusted it clean against his four legs, and stuffed it into his own mouth. Vantage number two. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Now, don't you think the sun is rather hot here? 
Oh, it is. And before the elephant shot even thought he was doing, he put out his trunk and he slooped up a sloop of mud from the banks of the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River. <laughs> and he slapped it on his head. <laughs> or made a sloshy, squashy mud cap all trickly behind his ears. Vantage number three. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Now tell me, how do you feel about being spanked again? Well, I, I should not like that at all. Well, how would you like to spank somebody? <laughs> well, I should like that very much indeed. <laughs> well, you will find that that new nose of yours is very useful to spank people with. <gasps> oh, thank you. I'll remember that. And now I think I'll go home to all my dear families and try. <laughs> so he went home across Africa, frisking and whisking his trunk. When he wanted fruit to eat, he pulled fruit down from a tree instead of waiting for it to fall like he used to do. When he wanted grass, he plucked grass up from the ground instead of going down on his knees like he used to do. When the flies bit him, oh, he broke off a branch of a tree and he used it as a fly whisk. And he made himself a new slushy, squashy mud cap <laughs> whenever the sun was hot. <laughs> And when he felt lonely walking all across Africa, he sang to himself down his trunk. <laughs> and the noise was louder than several brass bands. He went particularly out of his way to find a broad hippopotamus. And he spanked her very hard to make sure that the snake had spoken the truth about his new nose. And the rest of the time, you know what he did? He picked up all those melon lines that he had dropped on the way to the Limpopo River because he was a very, very tidy pachyderm. <laughs> well, one beautiful evening, he came back to all his dear families, curled up his trunks so they couldn't see, and he said, how do you do? And they were all very glad to see him and immediately said, come here and be spanked for your satiable curiosity. Pooh. I don't think you people know anything about spanking, but I do, and I'll show you. And then he uncoiled his trunk and knocked two of his dear brothers head over heels. <laughs> oh, banana said, where'd you learn that trick, and what have you done to your nose? I got a new one. <laughs> From the banks of the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River, I asked a cracker, what do you have for dinner? And he gave me this to keep. <laughs> it looks very ugly, said his hairy uncle the baboon. It does, but it's very useful. <laughs> and he picked up his hairy uncle baboon by one hairy leg, and he hove him into a hornet's nest. <laughs> and then that elephant child spanked all his dear families till they were very warm and greatly astonished. He plucked out his tall ostrich and his tail feathers. He dragged his tall uncle giraffe by one hind leg through a thorn bush. He shouted at his broad aunt the hippopotamus and blew bubbles into her ear when she was trying to sleep in the water after meals. <laughs> but he never let anybody touch his friend, Colo Colo Bird. At last, things grew so exciting that all of his dear families went off one by one in a hurry to the banks of the great, gray, green, greasy Limpopo River to borrow new noses from the crocodile. And when they all came back, nobody spanked anybody anymore. <laughs> and ever since that day, oh best beloveds, all the elephants that you will ever see, besides all those that you won't see, <laughs> have trunks precisely like the trunk of that satiable elephant's child. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now, how many of you are hearing that story for the very first times in your life? <laughs> Look at that. You've, you've been deprived. These deprived children. You know, a, a generation probably before yours, everyone knew those stories. And I don't think they belong on a dusty shelf. They, you know, these are timeless stories that, for all ages. You know, even though they're written for little kids, you know, it's like a good cartoon. There's a lot of wordplay and a lot of sophisticated humor throughout this. So it's, it's hard to say who appreciates these stories better, the adults or the kids. But that is the, that's the mark of a great writer because he really appealed to everybody and you know it, he really broke the mold for um, writing to kids you know 
serious authors never lowered themselves to write for kids. That was just like not done, you know? And, and he wanted to create good literature for his kids. So it wasn't there, he wrote it. <laughs> and nowadays, you know, every other when they, you know, author, when they write for little kids, they use little kids' language. Make it simple for them to understand. He didn't, he didn't believe in that. You want to develop a kid's our vocabulary? You sprinkle in all those eloquent, articulated you know, phrases in there, and they'll get it from the context, and they'll come out with a much better command of the language. So it was, he really, really set the standard, I think, for what's called poor qua stories, and, and they're really timeless. So um, I threw in a little musical joke in the story. I wanted to see if anybody in this audience was as musically erudite enough to n have recognized. You recognize the tune. What is it? Baby All Over the Wall from Atari by Henry Mancini. Oh, man, she's got the author and everything. Dun, 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 You get a, you get a, you, you get, to, you get a, a, a free show. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, amazing. You really nailed that one. I'm impressed. So, so, so a lot of times I have to explain it to the whole group, but no, there's a few. All right. So um, he he really uh, had fun tell, writing those stories for kids, and um, and they've survived the test of time, as 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 you've um, just witnessed. So um, I, I usually throw in about four of them. I think I'm going to have to cut, cut it down to three tonight, because um, I want to leave some time to talk about him and, um, and talk about some serious things about him. But um, I, the next story, I am going to just jump into another uh, Just So story before we uh, talk about Kipling himself. And um, I need to warn you, before I tell this short five, six minute story, that there's going to be a quiz at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, to see how well you've been listening. And it's only one question. <laughs> And, and you, you sometimes, I don't know, you, some, usually no one gets it, but I, I, I have a feeling this group's gonna nail it. <laughs> All right, so th this um, is actually the very first story that I learned of Rudyard Kipling's, and I actually credit the man for uh, catalyzing my storytelling career, because I came upon these stories. I had studied mime, and I wanted to find a vehicle to use some of my uh, characterizations and, and vo vocals and movement. To, and I, these were just, these just lent themselves so well to it. And, and I didn't realize that I had become a storyteller in the process, but um, I, I, my first repertoire were his stories, and I don't think I've come across any better written stories since. You know, they're just magnificently um, crafted. All right, so this starts. In the sea, once upon a time, oh my best beloved, there was a whale and he ate fishes. He ate the starfish and the garfish and the crab and the dab and the place and the dace and the skate and his mate and the mackerel and the pickerel and the very truly twirly-whirly eel. All the fishes he could find in all of the sea, he ate with his mouth like so. So at last, there was only one small fish left in all of the sea, and he was a small stoot fish. He swam a little bit behind the whale's right ear so as to keep out of harm's way. Mm. And the whale stood up on his tail and said, I'm hungry. And the small stoot fish in this said in a small stoot voice, Noble and generous cetacean, have you ever tasted man? No, what's it like? Mice, mice but nubbly. Then fetch me some, said the whale, and he made the sea froth up with his tail. Well, one at a time is enough. If you swim to latitude 50 north, longitude 40 west, you'll find sitting on a raft in the middle of the sea with nothing on but a pair of blue canvas breeches and a pair of suspenders. You must particularly remember the suspenders, best beloved. <laughs> the jackknife, one shipwrecked mariner who is only fair to tell you is a man of infinite resource and sagacity. So the whale swam and swam to latitude 50 north, longitude 40 west, and they're sitting on a raft in the middle of the sea with nothing on but a pair of blue canvas breeches and a pair of suspenders, which you must not forget. And a jackknife, one single solitary shipwrecked mariner trailing his toes in the water. Uh, he did have his mummy's leave to paddle or else he would not have done that. <laughs> because he was a man of infinite resource and sagacity. 
Then the whale opened up his mouth back and back and back, tearingly touched his tail, and he swallowed the shipwrecked mariner and the raft he was sitting on in the blue canvas breeches and the suspenders, which you must not forget, and the jackknife. He swallowed them all down in his warm, dark inside cupboard, smacked his lips like so, and turned around three times on his tail. Mm. But when the mariner found himself truly inside the whale's warm, dark inside cupboards, yuck! He stumped and he jumped and he thumped and he bumped and he pranced and he danced and he banged and he clanged and he prowled and he howled and he crawled and he bowled and he cried and he sighed and he leapt and he crept and he hopped and he jumped and he danced hornpipes where he shouldn't and the whale felt most unhappy indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Have you forgotten the suspenders? Okay, okay. So, so, so the whale said to the stew fish, this man is very nubbly and besides he's making me, uh, making me uh, hiccup. What should I do? Uh, yeah. Tell him to come out. <laughs> so the whale called down his own throat to the shipwrecked mariner. Come out and behave yourself. I've got the, uh, I've got the hiccup. Uh, uh, nay, nay, said the man, not sure before otherwise. You take me to my natal shores and the white cliffs of Albion, and I'll think about it. And begin to dance more than ever. <laughs> I'd better take him home. I warned you, he was a man of infant resource and sagacity. <sighs> So the whale, whale, so the whale swam and swam with both his flippers and his tails as hard as he could for the <laughs> hiccups, till at last he saw the man's natal shores, the white cliffs of Albion. He rushed halfway up the beach, opened his mouth, opened his mouth wide and wide and wide and said, change here for Winchester, Ashwila, Nashua, Keene, and all stations in the <laughs> Fitchburg Road. <laughs> and just as he said, Fitch, the mariner walked out of his mouth. <laughs> But while the whale had been swimming, this mariner, who was indeed a person of infinite resource and sagacity, had taken his jackknife and cut up that raft in a little square grating, all running crisscross, and tied it firm with his suspenders. Now you know why you're not to forget those suspenders. <laughs> and then he dragged that grating good and tight into the whale's throat, and there it stuck. And then he recited the following sloka, which as you have not yet heard it, I will now proceed to relate. By means of a grating, I have stopped. You're eating. <laughs> well, the mariner walked off the beach, went home to his mother, who had given him leave to trail his toes in the water, and he eventually married, and he lived happily ever after. Oh, so did the whale. But the grating in his throat, which he could neither cough up <coughs> nor swallow down, <coughs> it prevented him from eating anything except very, very small fish, which is why whales nowadays never eat men or boys or little girls. <laughs> The stute fish went and hid himself in the mud under the dorsals of the equator. He was afraid that the whale might be angry with him. <laughs> but the mariner took his jackknife home. He was wearing those blue canvas breeches when he went off the beach to his mother, but the suspenders were left behind to see to tie the grating with, and that's the end of that tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you probably think you already passed the test because you didn't forget the suspenders. But I knew you were not going to forget the suspenders. How could you not forget? No, that's too simple. OK, so here's the real one question test. Does anybody remember at what latitude and longitude was the raft? <laughs> you got it? Oh, you're not good with numbers. Uh, she's good with music, not numbers. OK, mm, I'm going to have to fail all of you, huh? All right. Well, I, I'll tell you what it was, but it probably won't mean anything because they're just numbers. But I'm going to illustrate where latitude 50 north, longitude 40 west is, so you can appreciate this. And if um, you've forgotten from your school days how, how that works, remember longitude starts with the word long, it goes that way, and there's one big latitude one, that's the equator, that's zero, so you keep going up. So I've got a globe here that will illustrate, and also it'll be a good opportunity to, to um, tell you a little about Kipling and, and how much he traveled. Okay, yeah, yeah, Shh. yeah, I, I won't forget, Shh. sorry, sorry to bother you. Okay, okay, all right, so here's zero degrees, uh, and then you go up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, here getting close to the, the uh, Arctic Circle there, and where it intersects 40 degrees west, uh, it's here in the North Atlantic, which happens to be, not by coincidence, prime feeding grounds for those whales that he was talking about. He got his science right there. He knew what he was talking about. So, uh, uh, but while I have this out, it's a good uh, opportunity to impress upon you just how well traveled this man was at a time when traveling was no easy feat. He was born in Bombay, India. 
You won't find that on a current map anymore because his name has changed to Mumbai. Okay, so there we have on the west coast of India. He ended up starting, getting married and starting his family in Brattleboro, Vermont. There, now if you look, that's about as far across the north and, you know, you, know, you can get. Now even if you could fly, that would be quite a trip. But of course, you know, there were no planes in those days, nor were there canals. So, to get from there to there, you got to go way down below the banks of the great, gray, green, greasy limp over there in South Africa and um, to get there. And these were long, arduous trips, and sometimes they were pretty uh, rough. And um, on one of the crossings, when he was going back with his uh, young uh, little American and his family there, back crossing the puddle, which he did many times, um, the seas were particularly bad. Uh, he was going this way. Um, and he uh, got deathly ill of pneumonia, as, as did his daughter. And in those days, pneumonia was this really serious business, because they, uh, they did not think um, he was going to survive that. Um, they, th they thought his daughter would. Because Kipling was not a, um, he, had, he was a very unhealthy young man. He got healthier as he lived in Vermont, and he's a, he did an amazing turnaround. Something about Vermont and the, North, the New England climate really worked with him. So, but before that, he, he, was not, he's, he wasn't a strong, healthy man as a, as a lad. His daughter was fine, um, but really sadly, is the, the expectation was the opposite of what happened. Um, Kipling was in a New York hospital for several weeks, and the world was waiting on, with bated breath whether he was going to pull out of this. Because th at the time, he really was the most popular author in the world. Everybody knew his work. And um, they were praying for him, and, um, and his daughter passed and, uh, at a very young age. And, and he was a very different kind of model of a father because um, he had some rough spots in his younger years. Not with his, his parents were wonderful, but there was a period of time that he was in the care of a monster. And so he knew how fragile, you know, kids' egos and, and, and hearts are. So he was this wonderful, wonderful hands-on dad. And um, he loved those children really dearly, so losing his best beloved was, was devastating to him. They could not tell him that she died until he was really out of the woods, because that would have killed him. So when he, he did get the news and was well enough, he, he was a very private, guarded man. And uh, he never showed things outwardly. But you, you know how much that, that must have really crushed his spirit. But um, he, he did, uh, and he had some real major tragedies in his life. Uh, he had a son. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of controversy about Kipling's politics, and I'm going to address it a little bit more in a while, but one of the things that uh, is fair to say about him is he was not a dove. Um, he was, uh, and as a matter of fact, he was very much involved in the military um, as a young teenager, like a 19-year-old, 20 some of his first works were describing the lives of the soldiers. And before there was such a term as an embedded journalist, he was really you know, living with them in the barracks and capturing their lives. So one of his books was the Barrack Ballads. And the reason why he was so adored, not just by the literati, but by the regular people, was they knew he understood their lives. So he could really capture that. And so it was these soldiers who loved Kipling because they knew he understood what war was like. And you would have thought that that would have impressed him enough that he would not have wanted his son to go into service, but his son really wanted to. Uh, his son had the same poor eyesight that his father did. He could have easily gotten out of it, but they knew people, they pulled some strings, he got in, and he was one of the first people to go missing in that World War I. Yeah, so it was, uh, again, this devastating blow of losing um, another of his best beloveds. And uh, again, privately, he would never speak about such a thing, but he, was, uh, he used that grief to do a lot of things. One of the things to start um, 
a fund for the, you know, the finding the missing, you know, and graves, and graves for the unmarked. You know, he, he was very active in honoring the families of, of the missing. Um, and uh, there's a line in one of his stories where, where you can see he obliquely just says, describes what might be eating at his heart, whereas like there's a line that says, if asked why we died, tell them it was because your father, your father lied. So this was, uh, you can, it's, it's really close to home. Um, anyhow, I got distracted here by telling you uh, about uh, Kipling's loss of his daughter there, and I was going somewhere with it, but uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, <laughs> so he knew a lot of, um, um, triumphs and he was really celebrated and he also knew a lot of, of huge you know, blows and tragedies. Um, he, in, in some way he had a lot in common with um, Samuel Clemens who also had a, a lot of ups and downs and, and major losses with his children. And uh, they, they overlapped in time. Uh, Kick, uh, Twain, uh, Kick Clemens was older than him and <laughs> Kipling was so private. In the four years that he lived in Brattleboro, he designed his house in such a way that his study was impenetrable. <laughs> you had to go through Carrie's, his wife's study to get to him. And she was referred to as the dragon lady because you could not get past it. And if he wanted to, he had two escape routes. He could go out onto the, he could go behind her office and go out the front door, or he could sneak out onto the porch and go out that way. And so he was like a gopher hole. He had his outs. And uh, his wife could honestly say, I'm sorry, he's out. Yeah. <laughs> but not, he did not grant one interview that whole time. And that's really frustrating. If you are a journalist in, in Vermont, and you're the most famous author in the world is in your backyard, and you want to get a piece of them, and you're not getting anything, what do you do? Same thing that the, the journalists do nowadays, the, you know, the, the rags, the, you know, you know, the, the inquirer type things. They just make this stuff up. And they had a field day with him because he didn't play the game. And, and there was a lot of mis... He was uh, abused a lot by the press, I would say. And uh, he didn't play the game, and uh, he just... Uh, there was a lot of misunderstandings about him. And I, I like to kind of correct a few of them. And I think what I'm going to use as a vehicle to talk about him is a poem. Uh, he's, it's probably his most famous poem is called If. And uh, again, generations ago, if they had to do an oral thing in school, it's likely they would have picked, you know, a lot of people have that down to memorization. Um, so uh, it's, it, People don't realize how much this poem really reflects who Kipling is, who was. So um, I'm going to have you, I'm going to give four, I'm going to give, um, uh, there's four verses. I'm going to have you read it instead of me reading it. Who, who, who's a good reader here? Does any have volunteers, a, a, a voice here? Okay, I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you number, um, number two. Okay, and I want to, um, uh, somebody, uh, did anybody else? Oh, good, good. Can I give, give you number three? And I want two men for the first and the last. Are you, are you willing, sir? You have a, no? Yeah? Okay, okay, here. Why don't you take the, why don't you take the, the, the last one, the four, and, and the, 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 the opening one. Has there got a, another man who is uh, willing to voice this? Sir? Yeah, yeah. Sir, would you, you willing? Sure, okay. Uh, and then we'll talk about the poem. No, number one, start off. Me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. At the top of the yeah. page? Okay. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied, and lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, 
if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings and uh, lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving ones can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distant run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and, which is more, you be a man, my son. Nice reading. Thank you. You can hold, you can hold on to those if you like. Um, so let's just look at um, some of these things and how they relate to his life. Let's start at the back. If you can talk with crowds and keep, walk with kings nor lose the common touch. They tried to give him a knighthood. He, he's not interested in that. He just would just let him be, just let him write. You know, he really, um, he accepted the Nobel Prize, but he, he really was not, um, he was not, he didn't flaunt it. He was a regular guy. And, and people who, he, who worked for him and, um, and he really did very well with the common man, and that's why they liked him. Um, and uh, I, I meant to tell you why, 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 one thing I wanted to tell you about the getting the globe out. When he was writing, when he was in Vermont, he was, he, one of the books he wrote while he was in Vermont was Captain's Courageous, which um, captures the life of a, a boy who was, should have drowned but was picked up by a, the cod fishing fleet. And, um, and uh, became a man, my son. Uh, so anyhow, one thing that's so great about Kipling is how well much he traveled. And he said himself that um, to know a country, you need to smell it. And he Im really immersed himself in a lot of different cultures. And he really captured all those nuances and smells. And that's what makes his writing so rich. And he really did justice to all those cultures and places he's been. He had a really good ear for their vernacular and how they talked. And, and he asked a lot of questions to get, make sure he understood everything. So when he was writing ca about Captain's Courageous, he went out on those fishing fleets and he learned everything you possibly needed to know to write about it and do it accurately. And that's why the fishermen loved him. And that's why everybody who he wrote about loved him because he did them justice. He really caught their flavors. And um, in addition to being a, um, you know, a great writer, I think he's kind of a good sociologist or anthropologist because you get the taste of so many different cultures. And, um, and it's a simple theory of mine when he's talking about the elephant's child who's full of satiable curiosity. He's really talking about himself and thank and thankfully so because he really did his homework and he really gleaned as much as he could from these people so he he captured so many different places common people all over the world so um if you can hold on when there's nothing in left of you you know there's you're, you're down to nothing well he really should have died in that new york hospital but he didn't he held on with what he had um thankfully and and went on to you know live many more decades um, uh, let's see. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, lose, start again at your beginnings. He married, um, the reason he ended up in Vermont is he married uh, Carrie, Carolyn Ballastier, who lived in Dummerston. And, um, and they went on a honeymoon. They went on a trip around the world, a boat. And even at the young age of 26, he was already a very wealthy man and a very famous author all over the world. And all of his money was in one bank. And that bank went poof. He came back from his honeymoon <laughs> penniless. But you know, here's an example. He didn't, you know, he didn't grouse about it, he just 
kept writing and he earned it back. All right. So um, he knows about that kind of gambles and, and not, uh, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, uh, he knew triumphs and disasters by, by what, you know, disasters too much. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a troop tra trap for fools. Here's an example. Uh, <laughs> he was like, um, they heated that big, beautiful house in Vermont with coal. You know, so they'd write a check for the coal or, wh or whatever they needed, you know. And, and um, their, their bookkeeping was, was, uh, was a mess because people weren't cashing the checks because he was so private, he never gave anyone an autograph. And those checks, the signature on the check was worth more than what the check was written for. <laughs> So this created a problem, oh, no. which they solved. And Caroline, Carrie took over all the bookkeeping. She was very competent and did all that. And so she wrote all the checks. And, um, and, and realizing his signature was so valuable, they started selling it at the hefty price in those days for $2.50 was a lot of money. And what they did with that money is they donated it to the Fresh Air Fund. Because Kipling knew how much being outdoors and being in, out in the seasons, what it did for him. He was a sickly guy. All of a sudden, he became in Vermont. He became, you know, he'd ride a bike. He learned how to play golf. He played tennis. He, you know, rode horses. He was out there in the garden planting trees. He was like this. He loves winter. He loves the seasons. And he became very vibrant. And he realized kids need that. So he started, you know, help. So here's an example of, of you know, the media taking him like, the guy's such a mercenary jerk that he's selling his signature for this hefty fund. They don't say what he's doing with it, you know. But that, that's just an example of, you know, like, you know, <laughs> with it. Um, if you can wait and not be tired, being lied about, don't deal in lies. I, they had a field day with him. Um, and he didn't play the game. Being hated, don't get hate. He, he, uh, Carrie's brother uh, was one of the big thorns in, in Kipling's life. Um, he was a w wonderful guy, and he was responsible for building the Laka, the house that they live in, and he did a great job. He oversaw that product, project. And he was a very you know, liked member of the community. He was a jolly guy, and Kipling liked him too, when he was sober. But you know that disease comes with a, a flip side. And, um, and Beatty Ballastier was a different man when he was under the influence. And uh, that created havoc with um, Kipling and his wife. And there was, it escalated to the point where they, they were on the road, Kipling was on his um, carriage, or one was on the bike when he was on the horse, and they had, they had words, and, um, and Beatty threatened to kill him. And they're like that, which is not cool. And uh, Kipling didn't want to get nasty, but he took him to court. And, um, and of course, he won because he was, you know, he, the, but the, the sad part was, is this guy who guarded his privacy so much, all of a sudden was in this media circus. And in, the, in popular opinion, he just, he lost. And it was really devastating for him again, having to deal with this this media circus that was revolving around it that he wanted no part of. So, um, but he um, again, I wouldn't say he he hated <laughs> anybody, and there were still they re managed to retain a fondness for each other. Um, and I think um, there's so much you know misunderstood misjudgment of Kipling. And one of the things that I, I, that's driven me nuts is I'm trying to get some of these um, programs accepted into humanities uh, speakers programs, and, I, and I'm on the New Hampshire program. I can't get Vermont to touch him um, because of of the perception of his politics, and um, they they just like he is so un PC that we don't want to even go near him. Um, and it's like how do you know? Yes, he was a product of his time. Uh, he's been accused of, you know, a white supremacy and a lot of really dark things, most of which I think is really off the mark. Um, so, I, and what I do is I try and do a little damage control. And, uh, and, I, and the reason I started to learn about him, and I got to know 
Kipling so much. I have the privilege of being Rudyard Kipling in residence for a week every year in the place where he wrote all these stories in Brattleboro. So I'm Kipling there for a week and groups come in three a day, you know, historical groups or school groups. And I get to learn about his life and describe what it was like there. And in learning about his life, I was so, so impressed with how he handled his uh, daily affairs. I mean, you'd think the guy must have been a workaholic to produce a, a, a library shelf like this. And he did it all longhand. He knew how to use a typewriter because he was a newspaper kid. He, but he, he said that he didn't like typewriters because they didn't know how to spell. <laughs> I know, but, uh, but it was all with a quill. And um, so, but he, <laughs> how he could have produced the volume that he did, he worked in the morning from nine to one. And then he stopped. Six days a week, he took a Sabbath off. Um, and in those four hours, he wrote all those things longhand. And the rest of the day, what did he do? He, he had, um, even though he wasn't a social animal with big groups, he didn't like big groups, he was very much, uh, he had a lot of really close friends who visited him. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, other, uh, lots of famous authors came and visited him and stayed with him. And he was very loved by many people. And there's um, collections of his letters to, to different people and to his kids. He, was, he wrote a lot of letters, answered people's letters. And he, he got so much mail that they opened a post office just for him. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Anyhow, um, so he, he, he balanced his life and he, was, he became an outdoorsman and he went outdoors hiking and all that. And um, I thought, wow, and he was such a great dad. And, and he, was, he was so good to his help. And it was like, so I really liked him. And I didn't want to find out any more about his politics because you know, it's like you, your friend is, doesn't has, share your politics, you just don't go there, right? Okay, yeah, I don't want to lose my friendship because, all right. So I thought, I just, I like him. But then, my, the director of Landmark Trust had a gig where he had to talk to the Vermont librarians and give a speech about Vermont, uh, Kipling in Vermont. And he couldn't do it. He said, Jack, will you, will you cover for me? I say, sure. So I, I had to brush up because I didn't know that much. So I started to read. And I, wrote, I read this wonderful book, Rudyard Kipling in Vermont. And it shares a lot of stuff. And I'm so glad that I had to do some homework because I made up my own mind about what his politics are like and what he's like as a down inside here. And I'd like to share one thing he wrote. He was asked, he was asked a lot of times to lend credence to a cause. Like, you know, would you write a support letter for the foreign missions in Africa? You know, save these poor souls. Um, and this is his, his response that he wrote when he was called, asked by the, uh, the foreign missions of the Presbyterian Church. Oh, and, and there's another place where he says, um, there, there's nothing I could say, I, I have to paraphrase that one, there's nothing I could say or write that would help your cause, believe me. Um, but um, <laughs> here's how he, he, he actually responded. He says, it is my fortune to have been born and to a large extent brought up among those whom white men call heathen. And it seems to me cruel that white men whose governments are armed with the most murderous weapons known to science should amaze and confound their fellow creatures with a doctrine of salvation imperfectly understood by themselves and a code of ethics foreign to the climate and instincts of those races whose most cherished customs they outrage and whose gods they insult. This does not sound like the words of a bigot to me, you know? And I don't want you to think this. he wrote this when he became old and mellow. He was in his early 30s when he wrote this. And um, there, there, there's, there's, oh, and there's a, I guess this is, <laughs> I, have to, I want to put this in here. Um, so, I came across a little poem, a little ditty. It's like 90 seconds long. It really captures how he felt about different cultures. And you know, he, he grew up, India has this caste system. You know, it's really severe. And um, did he, was he a product of that? Well, I'm gonna share this other 90 second ditty for you and you can tell me, I think it captures everything that's wrong in the world with politics today in 90 seconds, and, it's, and it boils down to a thing called tribalism. Whereas as soon as you think 
you're, this is your tribe, and that's their tribe, and they are different, and they are. And then hell broke loose, and some people, all right. So here's how he addressed it playfully in his animated, playful way. Father and mother and me, sister and auntie say, all people like us are we, and everyone else is they. But if you live over the sea, instead of over the way, you may end up by thinking of it, looking upon we as only a sort of they. We eat pork and beef with cow horn handled knives. They who gobble the rice off a leaf are horrified out of their lives. They who live up a tree and feast on grubs and clay, isn't it scandalous? They look upon we as a simply disgusting they. We shoot birds with guns. They stick lions with spears. Their full dress is un, while we dress up to our ears. They like their friends for tea. We like our friends to stay. And after all that, they look upon we as an utterly ignorant they. We like kitcheny food. We have doors that latch. They drink milk or blood under an open thatch. They have doctors. They have, we have doctors to pay. They have wizards to fee. And after all that, they look upon we as a simply impudent heathen. They look upon we as an utterly impossible they. All good people agree. And all good people say, all people like us are we. And everyone else is they. But if you go over the sea, instead of over the way, you may end up by th think of it, looking upon we as only a sort of they. Hmm. I think it's just so right on. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I, um, there, there's, there's so much more I could, um, oh, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. Oh my goodness. He made some really bad choices in life with his son and with, it, with other things. And um, there's, a, there's a humility in saying, you know, um, if people are criticizing you, don't think about what, what it is. Make allowance for that and think on it. So I, 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 the more I learn about this guy, the more I... <laughs> I love him, and he's such a creative guy. If if you haven't seen the the, the, the I, if you ever get a pick, copy of the Just So Stories, make sure you get the copy, illustrated by, guess who? He was a really good artist. <laughs> his father was a sculptor and an artist, and he was fabulous. Um, so he did his own illustrations. Uh, there's a story about the run the um, oh. Uh, there's, oh, he, it's wonderful. And um, uh, I got to perform at a festival called the Just So Festival. They were celebrating his 150th uh, birthday. And um, they called it the Just So Festival. And they gave me this wonderful um, souvenir, stealing the design that he made for the elephant story. Just, <laughs> that, that's uh, very close to his own uh, <laughs> drawing that comes and goes. So there's so much about him that I, I love. and, and um, uh, I, I'm really excited to go hear a colleague of mine, I haven't read it yet, but he wrote a whole book about the poem If. Man, I can't wait. I've been talking about If for decades, and, you know, and now someone's written my, uh, uh, someone I went to school with in Vermont um, has written a book, Chris Benfey, and I'm going to hear the book talk next uh, two weeks from now, next week in Brattleboro. So I'm going to get a hold of that, and then I'm going to know even more about this stuff. So I'm plugging the book, even though I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure it's great. It's by Chris Benfield. It's called If. <laughs> um, so anyhow, we're getting late here. So I, I uh, oh, but I do want to tell you a little bit about the house that I get a chance, you know, the privilege of being in for a week a year. I just love it. It's like, um, there's, there's a muse in that house. I, I, I really feel it. So um, in addition to being, uh, you know, f being there hired to be Kipling for a week, I also know the magic of that house. Most historical houses, you gotta, um, you know, if they let you in, you can't touch anything. You know, it's like, you know, a tour. Um, there's an organization in Great Britain that was started called Landmark Trust. And what their mission is, is to find all these historical places that are gonna be, you know, that are go that becoming composting into the oil. And, uh, they, they restore them. And the way they fund it 
is they restore them so they can rent it out to people as vacation rentals. And, they act, and the, director, the, the first director of Landmark Trust USA started Landmark Trust USA specifically to restore, they started the American version to restore Kipling's house because it had been sitting empty on a hillside for 50 years. Can you imagine what would be left of a house on Vermont hillside for 50 years? You know, is there going to be any structural integrity of that thing? Yet? Well, Beatty did a good job building that house. The first floor is stone, you know, and there was like, you know, there's wood, there's no very, very little rock there. So there was enough structural integrity to that house that they restored it. And they had the blueprints of what it was like in the early, they took off the additions and, and the fancy fights. And you're pretty much, when you go in that house, that's what it was like when he was there. It was, it's amazing. And you can rent it. <laughs> it's, it's a minimum of three days, a maximum of three weeks, and it's affordable. It's like if you had a, a family reunion of eight people and wanted to take a motel, it would cost more than it would for the week to rent that place. It's, it's a good deal. And I rent it myself once a year to host a uh, storytelling workshop. And, um, and I, I encourage, I help people craft their own personal stories. And if you want to know about this uh, long weekend that I do in February every year, I encourage you to uh, sign my email list. And I promise you that no one else in the world will get your email address, it won't go in past me, and you'll get one email from me you know, after this, and then you might not get another one for another year, unless I'm performing in Tewksbury again, you know, I'll tell you. But it's a pretty safe thing to put it. And there's some information about um, uh, Nolaka. He, he, he titled, he named his house Nolaka, which is Hindi for jewel beyond price. And um, uh, I've been doing that workshop now for 14 years. And people who come in there, they say, there's something going on. There's a little, <laughs> there, there, there's a, oh, yeah, here's why I have this thing out here. There's a log book. I love every time I'm away, I come back and read what people wrote in the log book because most times log books are just like really boring. But there's something in that house that gets people creative, the juices running. And um, they, they, took this, they took the if poem and rewrote it to celebrate what they did to that house. If you can find your way to Fair and Olaka by interstate and country road and track, by watching every single sign and marker and fearing not to turn and double back, if entering you love the sweep of landscape and find the view is more than you had dreamed and the, think the house should sail upon a seascape, as Kipling proudly said, so it seemed. He designed it look like a boat on the thing. It's, it's amazing. If comfortable at Kipling's desk and writing, or happy in the attic playing pool, or finding that the books are so delighting and Nolaka really comes off across as jewel, you cannot help but savor every minute, a house restored and every detail just. Yours is this house and everything that's in it. And what is more, you'll thank the Landmark Trust. <laughs> <laughs> oh. that, house, that house is magic. I, I, a lot of times I'm doing school groups and they're, they're chaperoned by adults who come in. And they're so, of many different generations. And people will take me aside afterwards and say, you know, this place was locked up for, you know, for decades, but we used to sneak in here all the time, you know, and they did. And in the 50 years that this isolated thing on this hill, and there's nothing around it, you think how much vandalism would have been done to that house? There was, in 50 years, there was not one broken window. People snuck into that house and there was something about it. It's like, you don't, you, this is sacred. You know? <laughs> the first window that was broken was the crew when they were restoring the house. They accidentally broke a window. <laughs> but it's a great story. And then the, the log book, here's this, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm indulging with if, but this is worth it. This is not me or I don't know, this is anonymous, but if you can start your day without caffeine, Always be cheerful, ignoring aches and pains. Eat the same food every day and be grateful for it. If you can take criticism and blame without resentment, resisting treating a rich friend better than a poor friend, can conquer tension without the medical help, relax without liquor, sleep without the aid of drugs. If you can honestly say that deep in your heart you have no prejudice against creed, color, religion, gender, preference, or politics, then you have reached the same level of development as your dog. <laughs> <laughs> I had to share that with you. Isn't it beautiful? Okay. 
I, I could tell you so much more about that, that annotation of that poem, but I, I want to tell, end with one um, more just so story and let Mr. Kipling do the poem that goes at the end of it. Um, gosh, there were so many things I wanted, more, I wanted to tell you about the house and such, but talk to me afterwards. I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere. And I would love to give you information about Nolaka. And there's also, uh, if you want to hear more of the Kipling stories, they're on a DVD, which is for sale for 20 bucks, and you can talk to me about that. Anyhow, uh, this, is, this is a great library. They have this wonderful series here. And um, if you're not a friend of the library, consider supporting them, because they do great things. And I have had some colleagues performing here that you may have seen earlier, that, uh, and then hopefully you will continue to support the ventures here. So this last story that I'll share with you of the Just So, it has to do with um, his time spent in the desert. And uh, he, of course, needed to rely on the ships of the desert, which are, you know, there's the, the camels. And they are perfectly designed for that very harsh climate and everything about their eyelids and their lid, their, lid, their feet, everything is perfectly designed for this thing. Um, Interesting thing about, uh, uh, so this story is going to be about camels, and he was very familiar with them because he had to use them when he was crossing. Um, once he got to ride on them, too, and you might think that, you know, that's a pleasant thing, to ride on a camel. Hmm. Interesting thing about camels, every other quadruped just about on the planet knows how to walk efficiently. It's an opposition, nice and smooth. Yeah. You look at a cat, you know, nice and nice small. Yeah. Camels can't do that. Wired. They cannot, they walk in parallel. And think about how high their legs are and their shoulders up there. So they're like, mm. Mm. <laughs> So you're riding way up there on a camel and you're up there going Wah! And it's ironic you're in a desert and you get seasick. <laughs> <laughs> It's all, he also knew to be very careful around a camel when they're in bad moods. Because um, are they, uh, and they're always in a bad mood because they work so hard. So you don't, you want to be give them, you don't want to get close behind them because they can give you a really swift kick. You also want to give them a wide berth in front of you because they have the disgusting habit of expectorating. And um, so even though the story is called How the Camel Got His Hump, I think it also could be called Why. The camel got his hump. And uh, Mr. Kipling is going to recite a poem at the end of this. In the very beginning of years, when the world was so new and all, and all the animals were just beginning to work for man, there was a camel. And he lived in the middle of a howling desert because he did not want to work. And so he ate sticks and thorns and tamarisks and milkweeds and pickles, the most excruciating idol. And when anybody spoke to him, all that he said was, <laughs> just, <laughs> and no more. Can you try that with me every time I say, and the camel said, <laughs> well, presently there came to him on Monday morning a horse with a saddle on his back and a bit in his mouth, and, and said, <clears throat> Camel, oh camel, come out and trot like the rest of us. And the camel said, <gasps> and the horse went away. Told the man. Presently the dog came to him with a stick in his mouth. Camel, oh camel, come out and fetch and carry like the rest of us. <laughs> and the camel said, <gasps> the dog went away told the man. Presently the ox came to him with a yoke on his neck. Camel, oh camel, come out and plow like the rest of us. And the camel said, <laughs> and the ox went away, told the man. Presently the man called the horse and the dog and the ox together, and he said, 303, I'm very sorry for you with the world so new and all, but that hump thing out in the desert can't work or else he would have been here by now. So I'm going to leave him alone. And you three must work double time to make up for it. <laughs> oh, that made the three very angry indeed with the world so new and all, and they held a palaver, or an indaba, a, a punchayat. A powwow <laughs> on the edge of the desert. And the camel came along chewing milkweed 
most excruciating idol and laughed at them. <laughs> And then he said, <laughs> and went away again. Well, presently, the jinn in charge of all deserts came rolling along in a cloud of dust. <laughs> Jinns always travel that way because it's magic. And he stopped to palaver and powwow with the three. <laughs> the jinn of all deserts said the horse, is it right for anyone to be idle with the world so new and all? <laughs> Certainly not. Well, there's a thing in the middle of your howling desert with a long neck and long legs, and he hasn't done a stroke of work since Monday morning. He won't trot. <laughs> that must be my camel for all the gold in Arabia. What does he say about it? <laughs> Only Humphrey won't fetch and carry. <laughs> does he say anything else? Only Humph, and he won't plow. Very good. I'll humph him if you kindly wait a minute. And he rolled himself up in his dust cloak, took a bearing across the desert, and he found the camel, most excruciating idol, looking at his own reflection in a pool of water. My long and bubbling friend, what's this I hear of your doing no work with a world so new and all? And the camel said, <laughs> well, the jinn sat down with his chin in his hand and began to think of great magic while the camel went on looking at his own reflection in a pool of water. You have given the three extra work all on account of your excruciating idleness. And he went on thinking of great magic with his chin in his hand. And the camel said, I shouldn't say that again if I were you. You might say it once too often. Listen, Bubbles, I want you to work. <laughs> and the camel said, <laughs> but no sooner had he said it, he saw his back that he was so proud of, puffing up and puffing up into a great big lolloping humph. Do you see that? That is your very own humph that you have brought upon your very own self by not working. Today is Thursday. You have done no work since Monday when the work began. Now you are going to work. Well, how can I with this humph on my back? <laughs> That's all made a purpose, all because you missed those three days. Now you can work for three days without eating because you can live on your humph. And don't you ever say that I never did anything for you. Now come out of the desert, join the three, and behave. Humph! Yourself. And the camel humphed himself, humph and all, and went away to join the three. And from that day to this, the camel always wears a humph. We call it a hump now so as not to hurt his feelings. <laughs> but he has never yet caught up with those three days that he missed at the very beginning of the world, and he still has never yet learned how to behave. <laughs> and, and Rudyard Kipling tagged down a little poem at the end of the story for us human beings for when we get as lazy and as foul-mannered as the camel. And it's in the form of a, it's a, 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 a poem, a story that has a lesson at the end. So you might even consider it like the, the, like a, a, the moral of the story. So let Mr. Mr. Kipling see if he would come out and share that poem with us. Uh, Mr. Kipling, yeah, they would love to see you again. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, you don't have to bother with a jacket. No, just just come out. Just, just, just that's fine. Uh, oh, good. They're still here. Good, 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 good. Uh, Oh well, yeah, nice to see you again. Yeah. Uh, well, the camel's hump is an ugly lump, which well you may see at the zoo. But uglier yet is the hump that we get from having too little to do. Kitties and grown-ups too, ooh, ooh, if we haven't enough to do, ooh, ooh, we get the hump. Camellia's hump, the hump that is black and blue. And we climb out of bed with a frowsly head and a, a snarly, yarly voice. And we shiver and we scowl and we grunt and we growl at our bath and our books and our toys. And there ought to be a corner for me. And I know that there is one for you when we get the hump 
camellias hump, the hump that is black and blue. Now, the cure for this ill is not to sit still or to frouse with a book by a fire, no, but to take a large hoe and a shovel also and dig till you gently perspire. And then you will find the sun and the wind and the gin of the garden to have lifted the hump, the horrible hump, the hump that is black and blue. I get it as well as you, ooh, ooh, if I haven't enough to do, ooh, ooh. We all get hump, kitties and grown-ups too. Thank you very much.